A man from Luton was on holiday in Wales. While he's there, his neighbors contacted him. Let me pause and say this before we move on. It's good not just to have neighbors, but to be friendly with your neighbors. You've got to find out why in a minute. I wonder how many people are friendly with your neighbors. How many people know your neighbors' names? Oh Lord. Yes. Those may help a lot of you today. While he's in Wales, remember he lives in Luton. He's contacted by his neighbor. He called him to say there's a, the, his lights were on and there were people moving around his house. So he travels back from Wales to Luton on the following day, only to find his key could not turn open the lock. The locks have been changed. Somebody then came out from the, uh, the house and they started an argument, basically. You could say, I have to go with this man. And the story goes the person had bought the house from an estate agent and wanted to know why he was there trying to break into his house. It turns out the fraudsters had pretended to be him and legally bought the house without his knowledge. They pocketed the money and it disappeared. Let me, let me pause them before I carry on. How many of you are referring to your neighbors right now? They pocketed the money and they disappeared. They've done all this legally. Land registry, the whole works. you all look like that. <laughs> the whole works legally bought it, legally sold it to a completely new owner. Got the money, they're gone. And for the past two years, he's been fighting legal battles with the land registry, estate agents, and the current owner to get his property back. When I heard the story, the first thing that came to my mind was I wonder if the person who forced, did the force them was Nigerian. <laughs> well, this is the greatest 419 I've ever heard in my whole entire life. But the reality is this, there is a man in a battle to get his property, what belongs to him, back. So now I want to preach to someone I've called re recovering stolen property. Some of you don't know it tonight, but you've been robbed by the devil. Tonight, I mean, God wants us to recover what the enemy has stolen from us tonight. I mean, he's walking around with stolen property. Tonight, we can get it all back. Let's look at 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 30, 1 to 19. A little bit of reading, but it's good for the soul. Now, it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. Uh, and Ziglag attacked, sorry, south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burnt it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city. There it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahil, Noam, and uh, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the, uh, 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 the Carmelite, uh, uh, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, but we shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Bezor, where those stayed uh, who were left behind. But David pursued he and 400 men, but 200 stayed behind, who were so weary and that they could not cross the brook Bezor. Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him 
drink water. And they uh, gave him a piece of, of a cake of figs and two clusters of ra raisins. So uh, when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from, from Egypt, uh, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the south area of the Cherodites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the, uh, uh, the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? Yeah. So he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down there, then he was spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoils which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until even of the next day, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites carried away. And David rescued his two wives. Verse 19, and nothing of theirs was lacking. He was small or great, sons or daughters, spoiled of anything which they had taken from them. And David recovered all. Father, tonight we thank you, God, for this time in your presence. Father, there are men and women here, God, desperate need of this word from you. God, tonight I pray you would expose the enemy. God, tonight I pray this service, this time will be a reference point, God. Father, I pray tonight, God, what you've done for David, you will do for us. Lord, your church, God, your people will recover all. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise in Jesus' wonderful name, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And amen. I want to first of all tonight at God's uh, treasure, God's treasure. Tonight, first of all, there is a significant period uh, in the life of David where he's on the run from King Saul, uh, and he comes to a place where he seemingly has no other options available to him, uh, and he, is, he wants to get away from Saul. That's the only thing in his mind. Uh, and the Bible tells us he goes to the land uh, of the Philistines. This is Israel's enemy. Amen. Number one. This is numero uno, number one, that can't stand the people of God. Uh, David goes to the Philistines, and there David makes an alliance with the king of the Philistines, a man called Ahashish. He's the king of Gath, and to seal this alliance, David gives his men the, uh, sorry, the uh, Ashish gives David's men the territory of Ziklag. This is where they dwell. This is where they abode. This is where they are. To say, listen, we're now, you can almost say brothers, and I now trust you. He gives him over this area of Ziklag. Well, 14 months pass and as she decides you know what i need to attack the people of god i need to go after israel and he gathers all the princes gathers all the kings of the philistines and begin to prepare to make war against israel and as she wants to bring david into this plan and here is david now you can think about it he's stuck between a rock and a hard place I'm not just escaping Saul. I'm not just uh, running away from this man. Now this king that I found refuge in, he wants me to go fight my own people. Uh, he wants me to go and uh, fight against people that I love and people I care about. Uh, and you can imagine this wrestling uh, going on in David. But I believe that God, uh, oh, you could say, bailed David out uh, because the other Philistines kings did not trust David. They didn't believe his heart is as a, as a line with them was a, 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 he had their leaders you can see and as she basically tells David uh, you can just uh, uh, sit this one out he sends him uh, and his men home and this is where we pick up our story from uh, David and his men they go back home to Ziklag uh, and while they're in Ziklag the Bible tells us their home everything they valued uh, everything they treasured uh, is gone tonight church the Bible has a lot to say about treasure the Bible tells us that where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The Bible tells us that we have treasures in our earthen vessels. Jesus tells us not to store our treasures where it can be easily uh, accessed by the enemy, where moth 
and wrath and thieves can break in and steal. Tonight, the Bible goes on and on and on about this thing called treasure. And what I want us to see tonight to that church is the devil targets God's treasure. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear that the devil is a thief. John 10.10, 10, the thief uh, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And this is who he is. That number one uh, factor of this, this enemy we have, he is nothing but a stinking thief. I have friends tonight who have been robbed, who have had their homes broken into them. And I remember a friend telling me this was in South Africa, while his family, his wife is in there, his children, three children, young children that time, while they were sleeping, thieves broke into their house. I think they had let off some uh, uh, some form of a, a, a thing in the house to make them go into a deep sleep. They broke into the house uh, and here they are, they're, they're taking stuff, they're, 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 they're taking valuables and, and, and to make matters worse. One of the things they did in South Africa when they broke into your house, see, they would take your toothbrush and get a brush. To, to, to be stolen from is already a violation. But the, the, the people using your personals, in fact, it, it goes a bit more deeper than that. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Oh my, you guys are rewarded. That's how it Right? But to, 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 to be stolen from is a violation. But to, it's what, what's more worse than that is that people are walking around with stuff that belongs to you as if it's theirs. Another friend got stuck, his stuff got stolen. He went to the local cash converters and there was right there. And he had to pay to get back his stuff. The, just the, the cheap, the that's the vexation of it all. Tonight, the devil is a thief. And he wants God's treasures to you. God has given us treasure, church. God has given us the treasure of destiny. Destiny is God's expected end for your and my life. God has given us this treasure of his promises. His promises is God's help along the way of life. God has given us the treasure of hope. Hope, you can say, is the fuel in order to help us to persevere through things. He, he wants to steal our appetite for the word of God. He wants to steal our prayer life. He wants to steal our desire to come and gather in the house of God and worship God, I was speaking uh, to a friend of mine the other day. Uh, he was telling me how uh, his family were beginning to get saved and giving their life to Christ and cousins and brothers and sisters. They began to all go to a church and serve God. And he was just happy and he just blessed that my family are serving God and doing well, well, enter 2020. 2020 comes, you know what happened with lockdown, etc. and so forth. Uh, and all of a sudden, his family no longer go to church anymore. Because now all those things are more important. Now, all things have taken priority. And I'd like to wish tonight I can tell you that this is an isolated case and this is just an anomaly tonight. Amen? But there are so many people who have stopped coming to church since the morning 2020. So, like the devil knows. If he can steal these things, he destroys our salvation and he can take our life. So, let's consider the features. Of some of the devil's targets. In close combat activity, things like boxing. If you've ever done boxing training before, or et cetera, and so forth, they, they, they teach you, they tell you that there are places that you target. You, you, when, you, when you box, you have to target the head. If you box, you, can, you have to target the body. One of the most famous shots of boxes. Is the liver shot? You hit the liver and just it completely incapacitates your opponent. If you box when there is a cut, you target wherever that cut is. There are specific places you target. You can say in close quarter combat, but also you think about in war. Listen, church, in war you don't just bomb anywhere. There are specific places that are targeted at war that you go after. Tonight the devil has some favorite targets in our lives. He has some go-tos that regardless of who you are, he is going to go to this place in our lives. In verse 1 to verse 3, we see some of these. 
The Bible says that what happened when David and his men came to Ziglag. On the third day, that the Amalekites invaded the south of Ziglag and attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was, number one, burned with fire. This city that was theirs is now gone. But it gets worse. And their wives and their sons and their daughters have been taken captives. Whether it be the city, whether it be their wives or their daughters or their sons, this is what they valued, this is what they treasured, this is what they, they fought for, you can say. And the devil or the enemy went after them. There's a saying that King Solomon coined that I want to use tonight. And it's simply this. There is nothing new under the sun. Because of seeing the target of the enemy for David, I believe we see the target of the enemy for our lives. You can say tonight the enemy goes after our marriages, our children, our ministry. And our money tonight. He goes after our valuables. Make no mistake tonight, sir, man. If you're married in this place, and there's others who are going to get married in the future, make no mistake tonight, the devil is going to come after your marriage tonight. So I believe tonight a Christian married couple is to be a model of marriage done God's way. Because when marriage is done God's way, we get God's help tonight. Yeah. That you are to model that. I am to model that. The church ought to model that. Marriage is God's idea. But listen to me tonight, church. When a Christian marriage falls, that couple has been robbed. You've been ripped off. You've been jacked. You've been, you've, you've been sized. You know, listen, the devil wants to rob us of all our influence. So he attacks our marriages. There is a tremendous weight uh, upon a couple, uh, amen, living for God, uh, living together, living clean. Uh, you are modeling, amen, one of the highest pictures of Christ. Uh, he speaks about, amen, the relationship of the church uh, as a marriage. Uh, and when it is done right, he brings so much glory, uh, amen, to God. And he causes people to stop uh, and to pause uh, and to consider uh, and to see. Uh, listen tonight, amen, there are plenty of people we get caught up in so many other things that we begin to neglect the main thing tonight. You come after your marriage. Not just your marriage, you come after your children. Parents can be very protective over their children. And for good reason. Why? Because they are yours. They're mine. They're ours. And what you need to understand tonight, parents, is that your child is an expression of who you are, but they are not you tonight. I, I know some tremendous parents love God and fire for God, but their children are devils. And you can, you know how they feel, they're embarrassed, they feel shame. They've done absolutely nothing wrong, but that child's made a bad decision. They're an expression, but they are not you. Now, in saying that tonight, church, we need to see that the devil targets the next generation of the church. And what he does, he often sows seeds of restlessness in the younger years. Listen to me tonight. A child may be in church doesn't mean the child is saved. Just because you're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't mean that you, your child is saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. They need to make a decision for themselves to make Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior tonight. Don't think tonight by bringing them to the poorest house is going to fix things. They need to come to a place where they realize they need the God of their fathers. They need the God of their mothers. They need the God, amen, that saved them. And here they are tonight. Many times the enemy comes when they're young and he assaults them because he knows they're restless. He knows when they're young, this is their formative years. And what the devil wants to do, he wants to put his foot in every carnal desire they have and they see from sinners. Make no mistake tonight, our children see sinners. And without that, for, wow. They're having all the fun. They're so cool. They're so hip. They, they, everyone likes them. Wow. Never mind, but it's food is church. This year. Wow. 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 
there's a pull on their flesh. I know because I was young once. And there was a strong pull on my flesh. And who, who's, who, what's, what's, what's to make them different from me and me different from them? They are battling some things. Some of them listen to me, parents. Some of them are still young. They're going to battle some things. They're going to have to deal and make some decisions. And it's important they make the right choices about media, about music, and about friends tonight. And one thing I'll tell every Christian parent in this place, teach your child to respect you while they're young. You're not their friend. You're not their buddy. Your dad. Your mom. Let them show you some respect. Because one day that respect may be what that saves them. If they don't respect you, they're not going to take you seriously. They're going to take what you have to say seriously. It's like I love my kids. I mess around with my kids from time to time. You know, sometimes you know, we're back and forth, back but when it comes to, hey, stop it. And calm down. Because they know. They know. I don't mind joke. Hey, I cast me back, you know, banter. Love it. I don't mind. But it comes to point say, hey, stop your nonsense right now. Let me stop it. But I've seen people say, shut mom, shut dad. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> Shut up, what? Who me? Woo! <laughs> 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 you say? Wow! Overseas is messed up. The devil will come after your books. The devil will come after your money. They must go quiet now. <laughs> people don't have money. And they don't have money for several reasons. What are the reasons people don't have money? Number one, they don't have a job. Tonight, a job is the main way we generate income. <clears throat> and if you don't get a job or have a job, you get no income. You don't have a job. Especially you read nowadays, you know, which is I think is a good idea. The government is making it very hard for people to sign up. <clears throat> Go and get a job. Yo, strapping young man, young woman, get it all. McDonald's is hiring, KFC is hiring. But the second reason is spending. There are people who are spending more than they earn. And this is because they, they, they have no self-control. They cannot budget. They cannot save. They cannot tell their flesh no. And this leads to disaster. In regards to this, Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 34, so shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an, um, like an armed man. Well, I'll ask you about this. There are several approaches at a church sometimes. To give to its giving. Several approaches. One of the approaches that we can give or we can have is the I've got to give. I've got to. I've got to do it. I've got no choice. I've got to give. The second approach is if you don't, we won't. Give an example. If you don't give, we won't be able to fix the roof. Of the church building. And if we can't fix the roof of the church building, rain will come in to the church. And when rain comes to the church, it's almost like God is crying okay, because that He wants His church to give. So if we won't, this won't happen. You can have that approach. You can have that way you can say of oh, looking at things. The third one is give to get. Give to get is when we reduce God to a celestial vending machine and give into a formula. I give and I get. The problem with give and get is this. Is that if you know anything about a vending machine, sometimes you give into the vending machine, you put your money in there, you're expecting your drink, you're expecting what you paid for, you put your money in there, and nothing comes out. And because nothing comes out, what do we do? 
Some of us don't kick it. Some of us cuss it. <laughs> we begin to use language that should be under the blood of Jesus Christ. Because we are not getting back what we think that we're entitled to. Now let me say this tonight. God does give to us when we give to him. It is a promise. It is who he is. In fact, the Bible tells us it is the principle of sowing and reaping. That if you sow, you shall reap. But that should not be the motive or the reason we give. I, 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 my, my mindset when it comes to giving is get to give. And what that means is I get to give to God. That it is a privilege to give to God. It is a blessing to give to God. It is right to give to God. God who has saved me, God who has forgiven me, God who has given me so many things, and I get to give to Him. Listen, something I said before, church, we shouldn't be doing stuff because uh, 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 we have to. We should be doing stuff because we want to. I want to give. I want to be in church. I want to be in outreach. I want to pray. I want to read my Bible. I want to forgive you when you get me vexed. I want to obey God. There has to be something in us that wants to do this. Because let me tell you something. If you don't want to, when you get to deep waters, you're going to drown. You're going to have to want to. You have to come to that place. God, give me your heart. Again, that's why I tell you, my prayer nowadays is, God, let me love what you love and let me hate what you hate. Why am I saying that tonight? The enemy doesn't want you to give. And by doing so, he's robbed you. Then you have your ministry. Listen to me. Your ministry is not a badge or a title. Your ministry is not where you showcase ourselves tonight. Ministry is a privilege and an opportunity for us to corporately glorify God. It is a joy. It is, as we saw in the uh, memorial stones, this is where God trains and God develops us to be the man and woman he's created us to be. And he's the devil tonight. He wants to rob every church of his effectiveness. And God has given all of us talents for the effectiveness and the advancement of the kingdom of God. And he robs, we, 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 the enemy robs that tonight uh, from us when God has put stuff in us for his kingdom and we don't use it for his kingdom. We even bury it or don't use it at all or we use it for the world. It is a robbery tonight. Robbing kingdom advancement and kingdom effectiveness. I want to close with the look at the crown jewels. Because the devil has some crown Jewels. Crown jewels meaning there are things that are, impo that are important, but there are things that are really important. There are things that are valuable, but there are things that are really valuable. Those things that are really important and really valuable, we call them the crown jewels. They are his creme de la creme. He has some crown jewels that he wants to rob you off. Tonight, what those crown Jews are is faith and hope. The devil wants to rob you of your hope. He wants to rob you of hope for your future. See, when he takes the hope of your future, you can't see things getting better. You can't see things changing. You can't see things improving. You just can't see. It. You're blind now. But also, we want to rob you of your faith. In Ephesians chapter 6, we are spoken to by the armor of God. The, we, we, we see, amen, the soul of the spirit. We see the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of truth, the feet, uh, shot of the gospel of, uh, of, of the good news. And here is this powerful armor being put on. But Paul says something powerful in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. He's mentioned all the armor, and he says this, above all! Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Above all, 
What is saying tonight? If there's one thing you need, if there's one thing you should not leave home without, nor stay home amen, without it, it is better be your faith tonight. Your faith or my faith, it is valuable. Your faith or my faith, it is the creme that I creme tonight. The devil shivers, he shakes at the faith of a godly man and a godly woman. And tonight, church, the devil can rob you of your faith and your hope, but he has stopped God working in your life. It's over for you. I believe tonight he already has done that with some people. What I mean, he already has inroads with some of the people of God. And sadly, maybe you don't realize it tonight. Let me ask you a question tonight. Maybe I want you to ask yourself this question. What did I used to pray to God for before? But now I don't pray for anymore. And, not, and it's not because I've been answered. What did I used to believe God for? Let's put it this way. But I don't believe God for anymore. To so maybe being, the reason being, maybe you've lost your faith. Or you no longer have any hope that what you're praying to God for will come to pass. He's robbed you. He's robbed you. He's, he's stuck you up and he's robbed you of your faith, robbed you of your hope, and he's walking around with stuff that doesn't belong to him. So it belongs to you. It belongs to me. See, tonight, maybe you're like David. What I mean, you are where you are because of compromise. But also, you need to know, just like David tonight, this is not the end of the story. Because no matter how far a person has gone, I believe the blood of Jesus can go further tonight. And no matter how far you may have wandered from God, you are never beyond his reach. The Bible says his hands has gone whack short that he cannot still save tonight. That is our God. I want to look at four things quickly. Then we're going to pray tonight. Number one. If we're going to recover back our stolen property tonight, whatever that may be, okay, property is not necessarily a house. Property is what's yours. This is mine. This actually, this is mine. I own this. It belongs to me. Let me throw this out as well. My wife belongs to me. And I belong to my wife. We belong to each other. No, the Bible says submit to one another. So for that for free. If you're going to get back what the enemy of the story, first of all, don't blame others for its loss. This is what David's men did. And many still do today. David, it's your fault this happened. David, it's your fault they've been taken. David, we shouldn't have followed you. David, we just you know what? They're stolen. <coughs> Can I say something tonight, church? Failure is not final. Virtually all of God's people have known the disappointment of defeat and failure. Every person you see in the Bible, except Jesus, has told God. So guess what? You are in very good company right now. And what happens is the devil, what he does, he tries to convince us that our failures is final. And when you come to the place where you believe your failure is final, you stop fighting. You stop trying. You stop trying to advance. You stop believing in God. Listen, church, if it's lost, you can recover it. And you should recover it. But it starts with you taking responsibility. Not trying to advocate responsibility or pass the buck upon somebody else. You know what? I'm here because of me. I take responsibility for God. I'm going to begin to do what I need to do to get it back. Second of all, strengthen yourself in God. Verse 6, Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were, was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. What that means, he found a place to encourage himself in God. 
This is tonight. If you cannot encourage you, you will trouble. Because sometimes people ain't going to encourage you. You have to learn to encourage yourself. You've got to learn, you've got to, learn to talk yourself up. Don't talk yourself down. And this is not the end. Sometimes, man, we 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 hit a we we we, we hit a roadblock. We hit a, a difficulty. All of a sudden, we panic and we just want to just quit and just just howl. We no 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 no. I'm going to overcome this. This is not going to stop me. This is not the end. Of, this is this is as the French would say, it's a leap. It is. It's just a leap. I'm going to overcome this. Is your no box. You need to strengthen yourself. In God. Many of you remember what happened on October the 7th with Israel. Been attacked by Hamas. Horrible time. Well, on the 8th, my wife texted my daughter's friend, very good friend, again, we told the story, we met in South Africa, a uh, Jewish family, and she texted the mother and, and just sent her a very simple message. She said, Listen, we're praying for you. We're for you. We're behind you. And she mentioned in this text, number 6, 24 to 26, says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Every Jewish person knows this prayer. Mm -hmm. She sent them a very, very clear, powerful prayer. And I said, I said this in that church, we need to encourage others in God as well. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Third, we need to inquire of God. Verse 7 to verse 8. And David said to Abba, Father, priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abba brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this truth? Shall I overtake him? Listen to me very carefully tonight. Here is David. David is asking two specific questions. Should I go after them? Will I overtake them? I believe tonight you and I may be asking different questions tonight. And that is this. Have I left doors and windows open? Sometimes we can make things easy for the people. Mm -hmm. Am I the only one who's ever come to my house, opened the door, walked in my house, and forgot I left the keys mm -hmm. by the front door? If some thief walking around, you would just begin to speak in tongues. You know, God says, Shut up, man. God has blessed me. Hallelujah. Wait. Now he has keys to my house. I can't say to the man, How do I, how do you get in here? You give me the keys, right? <laughs> He's got the keys. Sometimes we make things easy for the devil to mess us up. And we need to ask ourselves, Listen, what? Have I done some things that maybe has made this? Easy, make this happen, make this take place. Have I covered myself properly? Did I let some areas of my life go? Choir of God. Lost it tonight. Do whatever is necessary to recover it. In Exodus chapter 17, there's a powerful account of Israel going to war with the Amalekites, funny enough. Same people who Rob them now, this stuff. They go toward the Amalekites. You know this story. Moses, Aaron, and her up in the hill. Joshua and the armies are fighting uh, the Amalekites in the valley. And the Bible says, whenever Moses' hands were up, Israel prevailed in the valley. But when Moses' hands fell down, Israel would be beaten in the valley. See tonight, church, what we need to see is that winning or losing was not determined by those fights in the battle. Winning and losing was determined by what was happening up in the hill. See tonight, church, it's so important. You and I cannot be laid back in spiritual things. I know some of, some of us are very lax and laid back individuals. Bless God for you tonight, amen. But when it comes to spiritual things, you have no right to be laid back. You have no right to be chilling spiritually tonight. Because what happens here, listen, when we pray, when we give, when we fast, when we respond biblically to the issues of life, it carries far more weight than we can even begin to realize. Because the people in the valley's victory 
was not determined by the skill, was not determined by the education, was not determined by the amount of degrees they have, was not determined by the, the status that, that I'm a director, I'm a manager, I'm a boss, whatever tonight, or who they knew. It was determined by what Moses was doing up in the mountain. Verse 17, the fight day of Malachans and the Valley Wolves. The fight breaks out. Two quick things will be pray. Number one, getting your property back is not going to be easy. You're going to have to fight. But number two, you're going to have to fight for a very long time. The opening man in our story who lived in um, Luton came all the way to Wales. He got his house back. Hooray! <laughs> However, he went away, took her time, and squats his movement. After two years of battle, squats has now moved his house. And now he's gone down to have to fight again. Get squatted out. Get squatted back. The man that this happened to happened to be a vicar. Priest. You don't want to say Christian. This is a church, and you take a long time. But we're going to win. Yeah. We're going to get it back tonight. We need to have a confidence tonight. And whatever the devil has taken from us, whatever is taken from you from me, this church, we are going to get it all back. And with some interest in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Every eye is closed tonight. Right? Every eye is closed tonight. Right? 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 Stolen property. Stolen property. Things that belong to us. Things that are ours, it's yours, is mine, but it's been taken by somebody else whom it does not belong to. Then you're here today, you're not right with God. Can I tell you this evening, friend of mine, that the enemy has robbed from you more than anybody else? He's, he's taking your time, he's taking your innocence. He's taking your joy. He's taking your realness. He's taking your peace. He's taking your tomorrow. And he will continue to take and take and take. Because his ultimate goal is your life. And I've seen far too many of that and it breaks my heart. One of the things the devil likes to do is lure us into a false sense of security. And everything's fine, everything's hunky dory, everything's good. We saw the life of the prodigal son this morning. He left the father's house and left with his inheritance. And there was a period he was the life of the party. Everybody loved him. He spent all that he had received from the father's house. He came to want. One day you're going to come to want. One day it's all going to be gone. The devil is setting you up for his final blow in your life. But tonight our God is the God of life. He loves your life. So much so that he gave his son's life. So that you will not die but have everlasting life. Don't let the enemy still from any longer and you should. Come to Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you will get it all back. Joy, peace, forgiveness, hope, faith. Yeah. Quickly, on the side of my voice, you're here tonight, you're not right with God, you're not born again from your backstage. Tonight, you want to come back home, you want to get your heart right with God. If that's you, just lift your hand up, here's my hand. I'm away from God, here's my hand, I'm not saved. Here's my hand, I'm Jesus. I'm tired of the enemy. 
Nearly 29 years ago, I got tired of being me. Ripping me off. I was pretending to be somebody I was not. My friend, what you see now is what you get. I don't, I don't have to pretend anymore. I've been around, you can call it the man them again. It's sad. When they're around me, myself, a lot of Christians, that they are who they are, but as soon as the other guys come, they become fake again. And look at that, that used to be, I can't live life like that anymore. It's ridiculous. Jesus has come to see you. You allow him to do something like that. Very quickly, anybody else, very quickly, no right with God. Backsliding, you need Jesus. So just be religious. Slip your hand up and I put it down. Like, quickly, 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 quickly. So we're going to move on to all things. Amen. But I want to say to God's people tonight. Tonight, there are men and women here. The enemy has stolen your passion, the fire for God. He's hijacked your hope. He's flooded you with condemnation. He's stripped you of your faith. You stop believing God. So I can encourage you that your passion and your fire for God can be regained. Peter let the Lord Jesus down. At a time he should have spoke up, he was quiet. But come Pentecost, Peter got up, he spoke up, he preached up, and 3,000 souls were added to the church. In fact, that was the birth of the church. A man came back more on fire, zealous and passionate for his God. So much so, we have two books on this man in our New Testament Bible. The enemy has robbed some people of some things. He's robbed your joy. Depression is a spirit. It is a spirit that wants you to dwell continually in a negative event of the past. And it's okay to be sad, but depression is going to be sad for too long a time. God wants you to be free from that tonight. The enemy has stolen your peace, he's stolen your victory, he's stolen your hope of some more, he's stolen men, any, 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 any possibility of things changing tonight. Amen. Tonight, God says you can get it all back. Because David got it back. All of it. The other tonight, the enemy has gone after your marriage. It's not his, not your parents. It's yours. It is a powerful reflection of the glory of God. Not just something we put on the show for people. It's powerful and done right. Tonight, don't allow it to take any more. Tonight, I want to challenge you, let it all stop. Let's all rise up to our feet tonight. Come on, the altar is open. I want to chat to the content. Come on, this altar. Come on, glory. Come on, lay a hold of God.